beneath, beyond, and above. Perhaps, perhaps it's one of the most difficult questions that one can answer. But many people think it's an easy question to answer. But unless we find about those problems, we'll keep beating around the bush. I often hear people mention problems such as bad leadership, bad governance, mismanagement, and so on as the problems with Nigeria. But they have failed to look at the bigger picture. Because these problems that they often mention are just the smaller parts of the bigger problem. And like I said, unless we look at the bigger picture, we'll continue to face these problems. You see, it's just like when you think about malaria and you forget about the mosquitoes. Or you forget about those things that attract these mosquitoes to our environment. Thereby, you keep looking for remedies without looking at the causes of the problem, which will make you unable to prevent those problems from, uh, from repeating themselves. To understand the Nigerian problem, you have to go back to history. You see, just like the doctors do in the hospitals, they usually keep the history of their patients so as to understand the problems that are peculiar to individual patients. And Nigeria is indeed a special case. But whenever we talk about the problem in Nigeria, like everyone else knows, corruption becomes a centerpiece. But I've always said that perhaps Nigeria is among the only countries around the world where corruption can be even justified to some extent. I'm not trying to give excuse to corrupt Nigerians. But to some extent, it has become a necessity. If you look at the wages that are being given to civil servants, for instance, and you look at the bills they have to pay, you'll understand why they will have to be corrupt sometimes to survive. You see, <clears throat> if one has to depend on the public schools for education, public hospitals for health care, in Nigeria, then one is indeed taking a very serious risk. It means that you will not be able to provide your children with better education and good health care cannot be guaranteed for your family. Recently in Kaduna, there's this problem of unconfined teachers. Teachers who are given uh, tests that are usually prepared for primary school students but couldn't pass. They couldn't pass those tests. But that's not even the question. It's, it's a very tragic situation, very unfortunate, but that's not even the question. The question is, who employed these teachers? And how, how were they employed? And who even satisfied them to qualify them for employment? You see? The problem is they are a product of the same system which qualified them, satisfied them, and later employed them. So if that is it, then whose fault is it? They are a product of the same system that keeps producing and reproducing the same kind of people all over and over again. Because they too did not have that good education. They went through the same schools who 
have unqualified teachers and they become a product of unqualified uh, system. And the cycle keeps going round and round again unless it is broken, it's going to continue. And the issue of ineligibility or unqualification is not just peculiar to teachers alone. It can also be extended to all other public sectors in Nigeria. For instance, you agree with me with uh, the Nigerian police. Recently, we, we got the news of the award they have gotten of being the worst in the world. Can you imagine? They are the worst. The Nigerian police are the worst in the world. But we cannot keep blaming Nigerians for these problems. We cannot keep blaming ourselves for these problems. And if we keep doing so, then we are missing the point. And it creates somewhat a compre uh, I mean, inferior complex among Nigerians. When Nigerians tend to believe that, okay, the problems of Nigeria are Nigerians themselves, we are just that problem. So it cannot be solved. But let me give you another example of the problem with Nigeria. You see, we have a very serious problem with our politi political system itself. And it is this political system that produces the kind of governance that we have at hand. Still, I'm going back to ineligibility and education. The majority of Nigerian voters who go and cast their votes, most of them, most of them, you will agree with me, do not understand the system that is, I mean, do not understand the system that they are running on. For instance, this is the government, the, the our political system is based on uh, a presidential system of democracy, which is the government of the people for the people by the people which has given the right to all people to choose their leaders in accordance with their manifesto, ideals and ideas, which means it's a system that is based upon education, ideals and ideas. But if you look at the statistics in Nigeria, only 50, somewhat something percent, I think about 53%, of Nigerians can read and write. And you will agree with me, you know the Nigerian system, the educational system especially. Not every graduate in Nigeria can even read and write appropriately. So which means the number is not even up to that. And this is the same system. I mean, with using the same statistics, the same number of people that are educated, the minority, which means in this case the minority, are the voters. The I mean, the people who are less educated are the ones controlling this voting system. Yes. And if it is so, why, why is the whole purpose of manifesto and building our system based on ideas? Because these are people who can even conceive the ideas. They don't even understand them. And that is what has led our political system, in turn, to produce what we are facing today. Politics of hatred. Politics of sentiments. Whereby people, instead of focusing on these ideas and ideas, the people or political parties present them with, they rather focus on religious sentiments, sectional sentiments, ethnic sentiments, and so on. So you see that is where the problem begins. Because the whole purpose has been lost of the democracy that we are practicing. But before you understand all this, you have to go back to history once again. Because 
I'm just mentioning these problems. But why are we having them is the question. Before the coming of the British, who brought us together in 1914, after the Berlin Conference, and made us a single nation, Nigeria. These Spartan ethnic groups speaking over 250 different languages. These people are made up of different nations. Nigeria was a bit of different nations. For instance, so good that we are in here today itself is a country of its own. It's a confederate state. It has other states that are independently running on their own. In the south, you have different num number of nations, kingdoms, and so on. And they consider themselves nations. But when the white man came, he brought us all together and asked us to be one. Thereby, we have to unite under a single language, the English language which means it has become necessary to learn how to speak English for you to be a Nigerian, complete Nigerian. So when they left, that's when the crisis began. We were hit by reality because we had to go back to who we really were. There came the issue of distrust and fear of domination the northerners are afraid that the southerners wouldn't dominate them. The southerners are afraid that the northerners wouldn't dominate them. So it became the order of the day. Since then, we taught ourselves to distrust one another. And it became a culture of Nigerians that, you know, I'm sure you would agree with me that we've had. Uh, this experience, experiences that you will be told that don't trust this northerners, you know, don't trust them. They are not trustworthy. And then in the north, they will tell you, don't trust this southerners. You know, they are not trustworthy. And yet we are a nation. Where are we going? You know, where are we going? There's no answer to this. So they left us a system, a political system, which is called the parliamentary system. We tried it, it led us to a chaos, and it failed. Let me give you one of the failures that the, the parliamentary system has led us to. In the course of my interviews, I interviewed a, a professor of economics and history. And he told me that once in the First Republic, when the government of the First Republic wanted to build a steel complex in Nigeria to produce steel. You know, steel is the bedrock of uh, every modern society, I mean, modern uh, developing country. So, the Prime Minister, being the head of the government, introduced this proposal. And when he introduced it, the Premiers there, representing the North, Western region, Eastern region, and so on, started arguing on where this investment should be put in Nigeria. They started arguing. And in the end, you know what happened? They decided not to do the investment anymore, not to build a silk complex anymore in Nigeria. And we lost that opportunity. And since then, the idea could only be resurrected during the Second Republic, when the presidential system came into action, that was when the idea came up again, 1979. Look at 1960. Since then, that was when the idea was conceived. But it was not done until the Second Republic. So you see, the political system is a problem. I'm not saying that the political system is not a good one. It is a good one, of course. It is. But it doesn't just fit into the Nigerian problems. It doesn't. Given our culture, given our peculiarities, our complexities, it doesn't. And I'll give you a typical example. There was a time I, I, was, I traveled somewhere in North England, Penrith and Cumbria. 
And I was offered a lunch by a wife's family. You know, I was very hungry when I went. So they invited me for a lunch and we went to the kitchen. <laughs> to my disappointment, you know what the lunch was? Two slices of bread, two pieces of fresh tomato, and chicken breast from a refrigerator. So they just cut a piece and just put there. So, you know, you know, can imagine that kind of food for an African man like me, you know? I'm used to Amala and I go see soup too and so on, you know? Heavy food. So, it's not that it's a bad meal, it's just a good meal. Perhaps one of the best meals that one can have, healthy. But it doesn't fit into me. It doesn't solve my hunger problems. So as soon as that lunch was over, I just got a lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Find a solution for myself. The list, the list that I can appreciate in Europe is chicken, whether chicken and chips or a good sandwich. You understand? Something hefty. So, you see, it is a good meal, but it doesn't fit into me. I cannot feed on that. It doesn't satisfy me. So, the same applies to Nigeria. We need a solution, we need a system that is peculiar to the Nigerian problem. Look at the way we did, we did, we did away with uh, traditional rulers, as if they never existed. They're just ceremonial. At least in the United Kingdom, at least the queen is the head of government. Even though she doesn't have any serious rule, but she's still there. She has a responsibility. Our people are still influential. I mean, our political, uh, our traditionally, uh, traditional rulers are still influential with the people. Whenever there is a problem, they are the people they run into for solutions. Telling them to calm people down, telling them to encourage people to do this, to do that. Why don't you bring them into the system? Why don't you create the house of chiefs? From the northern Nigeria, from the southern Nigeria, eastern Nigeria, every part of Nigeria, we have these chiefs. And they are well-respected people. And they are closer to the people. These are people that we can always run into when there is a problem. Why don't we make them useful in our system? And with them, we can maintain something. Consistency in governance. Which is something we are seriously like due to the system we are running. There's no consistency. But if you put these people into government, have them under control, they are not going to be the head of everything. And even if you don't come from that royal family or whatever you call it, you still have an opportunity to run for other offices. They are not the president, they are not the secretary to the government, they are not the governors, but give them a role since they exist. They are part of a parcel of our society. So we shouldn't just tr throw them away. So, these are one of the problems that we are facing in Nigeria. Cultural problems. Cultural problems. It's the same cultural problem that give birth to some of the things that we consider corruption. Now you have been appointed into an office, a very big office. What is expected of you from people back home? They expect you take care of the family, take care of their problem, deal with their problem. So we have to choose one and leave the other. Either we accept that that exists and creates a solution to it, or provide a system that will stop that from taking place. Wherever you see co corruption on the law in the, in the, around the world, is because the system there has suppressed it. You are Nigerian. Okay, Nigerians are problematic. But I don't see Nigerians making problems on the roads of Europe. When they go, they see a traffic, they don't beat it. Why? Why? Because the system there is working. But here we beat traffic all over. You understand? I will not deny the fact that myself, 
I often be, because one of the problems with Nigeria, let me tell you one big problem that Nigeria has. You see, from driving on the road, you can understand some of the problems with Nigeria. In Nigeria, if you drive correctly, the way you are supposed to drive, I guarantee you of having an accident. Because, you know, it, it, does, it doesn't work. You can't do things. But once you start doing things the right way, you create a problem for yourself. That is how it is, not just on the roads, in our government offices, and so on and so forth. So, finally, the point that I would like to make to you, that will make you understand why there is this Nigerian problem. Nigeria is a nation that was created, it didn't evolve. I'll give you this card so you can tell them I cannot do it. Thereby, we must expect to face this kind of problems. They will come, you can just give them. Even the developed nations have faced so many of uh, similar problems. But let me give you an example of the United States of America. This is one of the countries that are recent, and it became among the most powerful countries around the world. America began with the immigration of some Europeans to that area that is now America today. When they went, they evolved. They started developing by themselves from one place to another. In fact, half of the infrastructure that is in the United States and America today was built not by the government but by businessmen out of competition, entrepreneurial competition. They built all the railways and so on. But in Nigeria, what happened? You understand? When the white man left, he left us government. And then government became responsible for everything. So we became over-dependent on the government because we accept government will do everything and we have no role to do. Nobody wants to go into entrepreneurship or private business. Everybody wants to go into government. Government. The only thing bigger than government in Nigeria is God. God is not <laughs> God is government, you know? So, what I'm trying to say is, an invention, every great invention you know in the world didn't start and end with one person. It started with someone, and someone will come upon and improve it. Look at the example of an iPhone. The idea of an iPhone started with a telephone. The person who invented the telephone never imagined anything like iPhone, but it was improved. So it's not for the younger Nigerians, to take this upon themselves and to improve on the system for a greater Nigeria. And I believe together we can do it. Thank you very much.